number eight, Morgan Lund. In March of 2023, a 21-year-old Wisconsin woman named Morgan Lund was arrested for stabbing her sleeping ex-boyfriend 19 times with a pair of scissors at their Oshkosh home. According to a criminal complaint, responding officers arrived at the residence shortly before 8 o'clock in the morning in response to a call from Lund's sister. Lund and the victim shared a child together and had recently broken up. While speaking with the police, the young woman said that she remembered waking up at 6.30 a.m and entering the living room, but she claimed that her recollection of what happened after that was foggy and that she thought she might have been dreaming at the time of the stabbing. Lund also claimed that she had been experiencing hallucinations of a dark, non-human figure over a six-month period leading up to the attack, and that she thought she was killing the being when in reality she was plunging a pair of scissors into her ex's back, shoulders, chest, face, and hands. The victim told police that he and Lund argued daily and that Lund had been violent toward him on previous occasions throughout their three-year relationship. Lund initially pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect to attempted first-degree intentional homicide. She ultimately pleaded no contest to reduce charges of aggravated battery and recklessly endangering safety. The judge sentenced her to seven and a half years in prison, followed by five years of extended supervision. Number 7. Tasman Glass In June of 2018, a 27-year-old Scottish oil worker named Stephen Donaldson was found brutally murdered near his burned-out BMW in a remote part of Kirimuir, Angus. He had been lured to his death by his ex-girlfriend, 20-year-old Tasman Glass, who was pregnant with his child at the time. Upon arriving at the scene, Donaldson was stabbed more than two dozen times in the middle of the night by Glass's new boyfriend, Stephen Dickey, and his friend, Callum Davidson, who then drove him to the site where his body was found and set his car on fire. The suspects were connected to the crime through mobile phone and smartwatch location data, which placed them right at the murder scene. During the investigation, a detective stopped at the cafe where Glass worked to ask her about Donaldson's murder. She showed an alarming lack of emotion while going about her day as usual. Glass maintained her eerily stoic demeanor, even after being taken down to the police station for further questioning. She repeatedly answered questions with no comment, which only furthered investigators' suspicions that she was somehow involved in Donaldson's death. Even more disturbingly, data from Glass's smartwatch showed that she returned home and slept soundly right after Donaldson was killed. The community was shocked by the allegations against Glass, who had outwardly lived a normal and respectable lifestyle up until that point. She certainly didn't strike people as the type of person who was capable of participating in a cold-blooded murder. But like many people, she lived a double life of sorts. At the time of Donaldson's death, Glass owed him money for a car and he had been pursuing payment, providing an additional motive to investigators beyond Glass simply being a scorned ex. All three suspects were charged in connection with the crime. Glass's new boyfriend, Stephen Dickey, was found dead in prison shortly after being convicted and sentenced to a minimum of 23 years. Callum Davidson received the same sentence, while Glass was sentenced to 10 10 years for her role in the murder. She becomes eligible for parole in May of 2024. Number 6. Jessie Lynn Parker During the summer of 2023, 29-year-old Jessie Lynn Parker learned that a man she had been seeing was in a relationship with someone else. After learning about the other woman, she allegedly hitchhiked to the man's home in Lady Lake, Florida, and entered through the back door without permission. After being alerted to Parker's presence in his home by his home surveillance system, the man instructed her to leave over the intercom and called the police. Parker was charged with trespassing and violating probation. She was initially held at the Lake County Jail without bond, but eventually regained her freedom and returned to the man's home. In December 2023, four months after the first trespassing incident, the man awoke to the sound of someone pounding on his windows and garage door. He later told police that when he checked his home surveillance system, he saw Parker trying to enter his residence again. By the time law enforcement arrived, Parker had fled the scene. Deputies tracked her down at her home in Leesburg, 
and arrested her on suspicion of trespassing. The case appears to be ongoing. This is just one of several criminal cases that Parker has faced in recent years. In 2022, she was arrested while driving a car belonging to an on and off boyfriend she was banned from contacting following a previous dispute. In April 2021, Parker was accused of violating a no-contact order by visiting a man at his home. It's unclear whether the man involved in her current case is connected with her prior arrests. Number 5. Ben Jenkins In July of 2022, a 35-year-old Scottish man named Ben Jenkins prowled the aisles of a Tesco supermarket in Rutherglen, Lanarkshire, in search of his ex-girlfriend, 25-year-old Louise McGarry, who worked in the store's bakery section. By then, McGarry had become terrified of Jenkins, whom she had broken up with the previous month. Earlier that day, she had told a colleague about how Jenkins had been messaging her constantly and how she had threatened to call the police if he didn't leave her alone. After realizing that Jenkins was in the store, McGarry tried hiding from him in the hallway of an employee's only area, but Jenkins found her. He pounced on her and stabbed her repeatedly in a frenzied rage. McGarry's co-workers bravely sprung into action and put an end to the attack, which left her with serious injuries. Surveillance footage reportedly showed Jenkins entering the store and walking up and down the aisles. He didn't grab a shopping basket and certainly didn't appear to be shopping for groceries before he appeared in the bakery with a knife in hand. One of McGarry's co-workers tried to stop him from going any further, but Jenkins said that he only wanted to say hello and pushed his way through a staff-only door. When he found McGarry cowering in fear, he immediately began stabbing her in the abdomen and then ripped out her hearing aid. Two staff members pinned Jenkins to the floor and held him there until police arrived, while other employees evacuated the store and rendered first aid to McGarry while waiting for emergency medical responders. Based on Jenkins' actions, prosecutors concluded that he had gone to the supermarket with the specific intent to kill McGarry. It wasn't necessarily surprising given the suspect's extent of history of offenses against ex-partners, including previous convictions for stalking, online harassment, and assault. Jenkins was charged with attempted murder. He pleaded guilty to the crime in early 2023 and was warned by the judge to expect a lengthy prison sentence, although it's unclear how much time he was ordered to serve. The judge commended McGarry's co-workers for their swift response to the attack and credited them with saving the young woman's life. McGarry recovered from her physical injuries but was left emotionally traumatized by the attempt on her life. She now suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety, and the effects have been so debilitating that she is no longer able to work and is afraid to leave her home. One can only hope that she's able to heal enough to resume living her life while her attacker remains behind bars, where he can no longer threaten her physical safety. Number 4. Ahmad Kazelbak a Maryland woman learned the hard way that it's possible to suffer severe harm without being subjected to physical violence when she became the target of an elaborate stalking campaign at the hands of her ex-boyfriend, Ahmad Kazelbak. According to federal authorities, the victim and Kazelbak met while working together at an insurance firm in Glen Burnie in June of 2015. They began dating six months later and soon moved in together, but the relationship only lasted for a handful of months before the victim broke up with Kazelbak in May of 2016. After moving out of the former couple's shared apartment, Kazelbak began taking measures to make the woman's life a living hell without inflicting any actual physical damage against her. He compromised her personal online accounts, forged cancellation letters in the names of her insurance clients, and made false abuse reports to police. As a result, the victim was arrested and jailed multiple times. After obtaining an order of protection against the victim based on false abuse allegations, Kazelbak spoofed the woman's phone number to make it appear as though she had violated the order by contacting him. On one occasion, he locked the victim out of her own Apple account through the password reset feature. He then logged into her Instagram account and changed her username to a derogatory term and changed the account holder email for one of her student loans to his own email address. Kazelbak also accessed the woman's health insurance 
insurance account and changed her contact, income and demographic information. The victim lost her health insurance as a result of the changes. When Kazelbach refused to allow authorities in Anne Arundel County to download the contents of his phone in 2017, prosecutors refused to continue pursuing criminal cases against the victim, who by then had been wrongfully detained and prosecuted multiple times. Instead of ending his obsessive revenge campaign, Kazelbach began filing false criminal complaints against the victim in neighboring Baltimore County, where the authorities were less quick to believe his claims and launched a thorough investigation into his allegations. Federal investigators also got involved, and they were able to prove that Kazelbach's claims against the victim were false, and that he was behind the spoofed calls and other crimes that had tormented the victim for an entire year. Finally, in 2020, more than four years after the stalking and harassment began, Kazelbach struck a deal with federal prosecutors and pleaded guilty to cyberstalking and intentionally damaging a protected computer. He was sentenced to four years in prison, followed by three years of supervised release. During his sentencing, Kazelbach apologized to his ex-girlfriend and promised that she would never see or hear from him again. Hopefully, he stands by his words. Number 3. Jonathan Christie 44-year-old Brandy Bradley of Kokomo, Indiana, fell out of touch with friends and family in January 2024. She hasn't been seen or heard from since, and investigators believe she was murdered by her live-in ex-boyfriend, 39-year-old Jonathan Christie. Prior to her disappearance, Bradley made a series of TikTok videos accusing Christie of abuse and saying that if anything happened to her, he was most likely responsible. More specifically, she said, if I end up dead and my dismembered body is found all over Kokomo, it was John Christie. In one video, Bradley claimed that Christie had choked her out on at least five different occasions. In another clip, she accused Christie of kicking in her bedroom door in a fit of rage. She also implied that Christie had threatened to kill her. About a month after Bradley went missing, authorities charged Christie with her murder. The arrest came following the discovery of human bone fragments and burned items thought to belong to Bradley inside a dumpster in Kempton, Indiana, where Christie allegedly said he had dumped some of Bradley's belongings. Several witnesses came forward claiming that Christie had asked to use their burn piles around the time Bradley vanished. This furthered law enforcement's suspicions that he was responsible for her disappearance and death. He also allegedly spray-painted his truck in an apparent attempt to disguise the vehicle. Police have not confirmed whether the bones belong to Bradley. For now, Christie remains behind bars at the Howard County Jail pending the outcome of his case. Number 2. Natasha Atkinson in May of 2020, 38-year-old Natasha Atkinson of Artesia, New Mexico, was accused of waging a ruthless revenge campaign against the father of her ex-boyfriend. According to law enforcement, the problems began after the ex-boyfriend broke up with Atkinson several months earlier, in December of 2019. For some reason, she allegedly directed her anger over the breakup at the man's father. Atkinson's arrest came after the victim accused her of slashing his car tires. A witness told responding officers that they saw the scorned woman committing the act, but Atkinson told a much different version of events. She admitted to throwing beer on the victim's car, but claimed that he had slashed her car tires. After assessing the situation at hand, police arrested Atkinson on suspicion of injuring or tampering with a motor vehicle and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. She was released from jail on a $25,000 bond, but updates on the case have not been forthcoming. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Richard Kerr. In June of 2018, 28-year-old Richard Kerr was accused of waging a relentless stalking campaign against his ex-girlfriend in the English seaside town of Torquay. According to authorities, he installed a tracking app on the woman's phone, sent a naked photo of the victim to her friend without her consent, and emotionally blackmailed her in a paranoid and obsessive fashion. In one particularly alarming incident, Kerr told his victim that he was outside her home and that he was watching her sleep through her window. Terrified about what might happen next, the woman stopped leaving her house unless absolutely necessary and reported Kerr's behavior to the police. Three months after the harassment and stalking began, Kerr was finally arrested. He pleaded guilty to stalking and received a suspended prison sentence. The judge also ordered Kerr to attend a Building Better Relationships course 
and imposed measures to ensure that he would remain under close supervision. Kerr already had a lengthy criminal history, which included at least 25 prior convictions for 50 offenses, including violent crimes. During the stalking case, the court heard that he had suffered from mental illness for several decades and that he was now finally receiving treatment. The judge acknowledged that Kerr had an appalling record of aggressive behavior toward others and inanimate objects. One can only hope that he abided by the terms of his sentence and that the victim was able to safely move on with her life. Number 10. Marrying a Snake Don Arguello, a 46-year-old woman from Texas, was volunteering for an inmate advocacy group when she met Nico Jenkins. Jenkins went on a killing spree in 2013 and killed four people and was sentenced to die. Jenkins had gone on an insane rampage for eight long days across Nebraska, killing indiscriminately before he was finally apprehended. He's been described by a psychiatrist as a psychopath. He's a crazed killer who spent all of his life in and out of prison right before the shooting spree. He had just been released from jail for a separate crime spree involving carjackings. Despite Jenkins being a sadistic criminal, Don Arguello fell madly in love with him. The couple are now set to be married. She described her fiancé as a very sensitive man. She says he's highly intelligent and that he never really heard a fly. At least, not again. She doesn't have a problem with his checkered past, nor the fact that he has now tattooed her name on his head. To be quite honest, Don might be a little crazy herself. Jenkins is a complete psycho. He sliced his tongue in half to make it look like he was a snake. He smeared his own blood on his cell walls. He also mutilated his own private part to make it look like a serpent. And finally, he has 666 carved into his forehead. But he's not the brightest tool in the shed. Obviously, Jenkins used a mirror, and the numbers came out inverted. Number 9. Doreen Leoy and Richard Ramirez Richard Ramirez was the night stalker, sentenced to death after convicted of a bizarre string of murders, robberies, and sexual assaults throughout Los Angeles and San Francisco. This was back in 1985. Richard is so famous that they've even just released a new Netflix documentary series about him. But the truth is always stranger than fiction, especially when it comes to Doreen Leoy, the girl that married a truly disturbed individual. Doreen was working as a freelance magazine editor when she first met Richard. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, she started sending him letters in 1985. This was shortly after he was arrested and while he was still waiting to be tried. She was struck by how vulnerable he appeared in TV reports. She had already been sending him letters and now she started visiting him. Soon, she was showing up at the San Quentin State Prison four times a week. Things got bad for Doreen at home after that. She became serious about her relationship with Richard Ramirez and her friends disowned her. Her sister told the San Francisco Examiner in 1996 that she was upset to be linked to her sister. She hated being related by blood to somebody going out of their way to make a relationship with one of the worst people the city has ever seen. Nonetheless, the pair married in 1996. The service was 15 minutes long. The marriage itself lasted for 13 years until in 2009 when something awful happened. Ramirez was linked by DNA to a terrible crime against a nine-year-old girl in 1984. After that, Doreen bailed. Number eight, the many wives of Charles Manson. We all know who Charles Manson is. He was a master manipulator who influenced members of his so-called Manson family to commit murders in the late 1960s. Manson was described as irresistibly magnetic, extremely charismatic, and hard to argue with. It's no surprise that a man who was able to convince people to commit murder for him has been able to charm women into marrying him after incarceration. Charles Manson was first married to Rosalie Jean Willis. He was 20 and she was 15 when they tied the knot in 1955. They moved to Los Angeles. Manson was arrested for stealing the car and Rosalie was pregnant. He was given three years in prison. While inside, Rosalie gave birth to Charles Manson Jr. She also divorced him before he could get out, later changing her son's name to Jay White. His second wife was Leona Stevens, married in 1959 and divorced in 1963. It's not surprising they split up. Manson had driven his wife and another woman to Mexico to pimp them out for money. They also had a child together, though we're not exactly sure where Charles Luther Manson is now. After Manson was locked up, he became engaged to Afton Elaine Burton in 2014. 
the pair obtained marriage licenses, with Burton being just 17 and Manson being 80. She started visiting him in 2007. The marriage was announced in 2014. How did she visit him in prison at 10 years old? But it never came to pass. It later came out that Burton had only wanted to marry Manson so that she could keep his corpse after he was dead and display it in a glass coffin for money. Number 7. The Wives of the Menendez Brothers Lyle and Eric Menendez were given life in prison for murdering their parents back in August of 1989. Lyle was 21 and his brother was 18 when they opened fire on their parents. They went through 15 gunshot rounds, leaving their mother and father unrecognizable. And while this kind of thing may happen more frequently than we'd all like to admit, this particular incident gave heaps of attention. That's because it happened in Beverly Hills. Their parents were very wealthy and nobody could figure out why the boys murdered them. The young men went on shopping sprees. They had a very privileged life, but things weren't so good on the inside. The brothers claimed that their father was abusive physically while their mother was abusive mentally. They killed them because they felt they had to. The brothers did seem genuinely remorseful after the murders. Maybe that's why Playboy model Anna Erickson married Lyle in 1996, but divorced him when Lyle got busted writing letters to other women. Then Lyle got married a second time in 2003 to a woman named Rebecca Sneed. They've been married for 20 years. Eric's been married for over 20 years now to a woman named Tammy since 1999. Do you think it's healthy to be married to someone stuck in a jail cell for over 20 years? Let us know your thoughts on this bizarre case in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 6. Married to a Bad Mortician Mala Fuller was married to a man charged with a double murder and accused of abusing over 100 corpses at the hospital where he worked. Amazingly, Mala was his third wife. How someone who plays inappropriate games with dead bodies manages to get married three times is beyond me, but he did. David Fuller murdered Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987 and got away with it for three decades. The only reason he was finally caught is that police looked back at the cold cases and used new advances in DNA testing. David was arrested in 2020 and officers went to his house to carry out a search. That was when they found the disturbing footage. He had recorded himself abusing corpses between 2008 and 2020. Nobody knows exactly how many dead people he defiled but it could be anywhere from 100 to 500. Honestly, nobody knows. He's been working at hospitals since 1989. That's a lot of time alone near dead bodies. As for his wife, Mala lived with him for 20 years and four months. After he was arrested and charged, she moved out of the house, saying she now wants to live a life completely alone. It must be sickening to know that her husband was messing around with dead bodies, then going home and messing around with her. Number 5. Living with a Killer Paula Dietz woke up one morning and realized she was married to one of the most ruthless serial killers in American history. His name is Dennis Rader, and he is the BTK murderer. Dennis moved to Kansas in 1970 after a brief spell with the U.S. Air Force. He graduated from Wichita State University in 1979 and got a job installing security systems. This gave him a great excuse to access his victims' houses. After getting his dream job, he went on to murder 10 people. Paula lived with him the entire time and never even had a clue. Dennis murdered four members of the Otero family in 1974. He killed a girl named Shirlene that same year and then two other girls in 1977. Then he went dark until 1985. Once he started up again, he kept killing until 1991. He was caught just shy of 15 years later in 2005 because of letters he'd sent to the media telling them about the murders. After Dennis was caught, he pleaded guilty to every murder and was sentenced to 175 years. He was named the BTK murderer because of the words in the letters he sent to the media, bind, torture, kill. Paula claimed she had no idea that he was murdering people in his spare time. Immediately after he was captured, she filed for divorce. He was granted by a judge the same day and she left Kansas soon after. Paula hasn't been seen again. She never gave a single public statement. No photos of her can be found on the internet. And she has never visited her ex-husband in prison. If you ask me, she really didn't know she married a monster. Number four, rock and roll and murder. Vark Vikernes became a big deal in the 1990s when he was convicted of manslaughter. He stabbed his fellow band member to death 
and then committed arson attacks on a trio of churches. His stage name was Count Grishnik, and he's played in a handful of extreme metal bands. He was given 21 years in prison for manslaughter and arson, but was released in 2009. He served only 16 years before he was released. Marie Katchett was just graduating from high school. She got a hold of Varg, the pair hit it off, and she gave birth to their son before he had even gotten out of jail. In Norway, the rules are a bit more relaxed about what you're allowed to do while locked up. The family lived in Norway for a bit, then moved to France. Marie and Varg had six children together, schooling the kids at home. They've actually gotten pretty wealthy by posting pagan-themed videos online and selling books. Number three, the beast of Ukraine's wife. Serhi Tkach attended the funeral of a friend's deceased daughter in 2005. The young girl was only nine years old when she was abducted and strangled to death. Going to the funeral turned out to be a pretty bad move for Serhi, as he was the one who murdered her. Some of the girl's friends were at the funeral. They recognized Serhi as the creepy guy who was talking to the girl just before she vanished. He realized something was wrong when people at the funeral began staring at him and whispering. He took off for his life, but was arrested by the cops later that same day. It's now believed he killed at least 100 young girls and women throughout Ukraine. It was a killing spree that lasted for approximately 25 years, from 1980 to 2005. After this sick monster was arrested, a teenage girl named Alina saw him on TV and immediately became interested. She started writing to Serhi, and they became pen pals. They ended up getting married in 2015. They had a baby in the prison, and Alina stopped her visits in 2018. She also deleted all her social media, so nobody knows what happened to her. To be honest, chances are she was a confused teen who saw a psycho and reached out for attention. But once she actually had his baby and became something of an adult, she realized she had made a huge mistake. Luckily for her, sir, he had a heart attack and died a few months later after her last visit. Number two, Carol Hoff in the stench of dead rats. Carol Hoff was the high school sweetheart of John Wayne Gacy. They were married for four years while Gacy was murdering and mutilating young men in his spare time. In the very house they lived in together, she never learned about the murders until after they had already gotten divorced in 1976. Let's go back to the beginning. The couple met when Gacy was only 16. They went their separate ways and then met again as adults. Gacy was a relatively successful man who ran a business and owned his own home. Carol was financially bankrupt and a single mom. Since Gacy also spent his spare time as a clown entertaining kids, he really seemed like a catch. They got married in 1972. With Carol not knowing Gacy had already killed a boy of 16 and stuffed his body into their crawl space. What Carol also didn't know was that before she reunited with Gacy, he's been given a 10 year conviction. He'd been divorced and he had just gotten out of prison on good behavior. He's been convicted for hiring teenage boys to help with his housework, only to sexually assault them. And yet Carol knew none of this. Then for four years they were together, she ignored the horrible stench of dead rats constantly wafting up through the floorboards. Gacy said it was a leaky sewer pipe and she always believed him. It's honestly hard to say if she was willingly ignorant or if she knew something terrible was going on or if she was really just that blind. Carol eventually had enough and got a divorce in 1976. When she was out of the house, Gacy really went crazy with the murdering. He killed dozens more before finally being caught in 1978. Gacy was killed by lethal injection on May 10th, 1994. And number one, settling down with a killer. In 1990, Sheila Keen put white face paint on an orange wig and killed the wife of her secret lover. Her victim was Marilyn Warren, whose last few seconds alive were spent wondering why there was a clown standing in front of her. Marlene was standing in the doorway of her house with a clown on her front stoop presenting flowers and balloons. Before she realized what was happening, a gun had replaced the flowers and a bullet went straight through her face. Sheila, still dressed like a clown, fled in a vehicle and vanished. The vehicle was found a few days later but Sheila was gone. The police suspected Sheila from the very beginning, but never had the evidence to convict her of the crime. The motive was clear enough though. Sheila was having an affair with Marlene's husband, Michael. Sheila wanted Michael all to herself. This isn't so much a case of a woman dating a bad boy, but of a man unintentionally dating the woman who killed his wife. 
27 years after the crime, police finally arrested Sheila in 2017. She was still living with Michael Warren, but because of time and the pandemic, Sheila is still waiting for a trial in 2022. Thanks for watching. If you were given the option of going back in time and taking back your most toxic and traumatic relationship as if it had never happened at the expense of also having never met your current best friend, would you consider it? Why or why not? Let us know in the comments below, but be sure to subscribe first.